those um, diagnostic um, criteria. The third one's really interesting. I had a friend of mine who was um, admitted with what was thought to be a brainstem stroke, but actually she had Miller-Fisher syndrome. This is the most common variant of Guillain-Barre. Um, maybe five or 10% of the patients will see in Australia. Although if you go to Japan, they see 25% of their Guillain-Barre's are Miller-Fisher. Now the classical Miller-Fisher has a triad of, of ophthalmoplegia, ataxia, and areflexia. And sometimes they get facial weakness and sometimes they get other cranial nerve signs. Now what's happening there is there's a particular antigen which is mostly on the nerves that supply the extraocular muscles called GQ1B. And if you get an antibody to that antigen, then you get mostly cranial nerve changes. Sometimes you get limb weakness. You can just get an isolated extraocular nerve palsy. And it is often misdiagnosed as a brainstem stroke. If you get Miller-Fisher and you have an altered level of consciousness and get hyperreflexia, then that's called Bickerstaff's brainstem encephalitis. Just another rare variant to be aware of. And if you do an MRI on these patients, it's often normal. The reason we're going through all these is because if you have one of these unusual presentations, if you've heard about it before, there's a, more of a chance you'll actually be able to make the diagnosis and maybe work out why that altered patient who's got some funny neurology has a normal MRI. Now the diagnosis is mostly clinical and there's only one test which is mandatory apart from other investigations that you may need to do to rule out other diagnoses like cauda equina and that's the CSF. So the, classically what you see, like doctors Guillain and Barre and Stroll, was a thing called albuminocytologic, uh, albuminocytologic dissociation, which just means high protein, low cells. And that's great, that's classic. But if you do the, um, the LP early in the disease, you might have normal protein, and you might even have a little bit of a rise in your CSF white count. That doesn't rule out the disease, it's just not the classical diagnosis. Now sometimes the neurologists will do nerve conduction studies, and that's all well and good. That's not really something we're going to do in the ED, but it might be done later. And the reason it's not very good, well, one of the reasons at least, is that you can only access a certain number of peripheral nerves to stick catheter, catheters into and try and stimulate. And it's a patchy disease, so if that particular nerve that you've stuck a, uh, your probe into is not affected, it'll be normal. And if it's so badly damaged that you can't stimulate the thing at all, well, that might happen as well, and that happens with Guillain-Barre as well. What about treatment? There's two good treatments. They both work as well as each other, um, and they're both best if started early. Now, in Australia, we usually use IVIG as our first line. It's convenient, it's well tolerated. The only downside is that it's expensive, the dose is there. If you're working in a place where you haven't got access to IVIG, like in some of the third world countries, then plasma exchange works just fine. Interestingly enough, doing both therapies together doesn't work any better than one or the other. But if you have a patient who you've tried one and it hasn't worked, then by all means, uh, use the other one as a second line treatment. Steroids don't work. And at the moment, there's some trials happening of a monoclonal antibody to complement C5, which may give us another therapeutic option. In terms of long-term prognosis, we said before that about 10% of patients have long-term residual neurology. So most get better, but not all. But even in those that do get better, it lasts for months and months and months a lot of the time. And so 20% of your patients still won't be able to walk by themselves at six months. So this is one of those things which has a huge impact on people's life for a significant amount of time. There's still a mortality rate. And so patients can die of respiratory failure or they can die of um, complications of treatment or they can die of um, the autonomic neuropathy, even despite the best of treatment. So there we go, there's the variants of Guillain-Barre. It's there to trick you. Um, there's a lot of different ways it can present, but if you think about it, if you've heard about it before, and you get one of these unusual ones, it'll help us to pick it. Thanks very much.